Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending upon where you are. I am Janice Kaminer Resnick and I welcome you. I'm sorry, I just have to remove, I'm very sorry, I just have to remove the Q&A function. It was blocking my screen. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of our leadership team, which aside from me is former Congressman Mel Levine and former Los Angeles County Supervisor Xavier Slavsky. We welcome and thank tonight's special guest, Jacob Heilbrunn, a journalist, author, and political analyst. His most recent book, and here it is, you can see I'm halfway done. It's excellent. Uh, the Right's Century-Long Romance with Foreign Dictators. Um, and it will be a very interesting conversation tonight on that topic. And I would also like to welcome and thank our wonderful moderator, Warren Olney. For the next two weeks, our programs will focus on the topic of growing anti-Semitism in America today. Next week's program is on Tuesday, not Wednesday, Tuesday, June 4th. We'll be welcoming back UC Berkeley School of Law Dean and one of the country's most respected constitutional law scholars, Erwin Shemarinsky. In January, as the campus protests related to the Gaza war began, uh, Dean Shemarinsky was with us to discuss anti-Semitism on college campuses. Well, since then, you all know that the problem of anti-Semitism on college campuses has, in has intensified. Some of you might have followed the particular problems that Dean Shemarinsky has personally experienced at UC Berkeley. If you haven't followed those, you'll be hearing about them more next Tuesday. He will be joining us next week for part two of that conversation about what's going on on college campuses, and that'll be with the esteemed Warren only again. The following week on June 12th, we have uh, Franklin Four, who's a staff writer at The Atlantic. He's the former editor of The New Republic, and he'll be discussing the content and analysis contained in his recent epic article in The Atlantic entitled, The Golden Age of American Jews is Ending. A very interesting article. I will be sure to send it out in advance of that program. For those of you who didn't catch it, it was at the end of March that the article first appeared. You'll find it extremely interesting. Um, and Madeline Brand will be our moderator that evening. So I hope you'll put those down. Join us. You can register for both programs right after in the email you get after tonight's program. Uh, all of our past programs are recorded and available on JewsUnitedForDemocracy.org. That's our website or on our YouTube channel, which is called America at a Crossroads. We also provide our programs via podcast starting the morning after each program. And the link to our podcast, as well as to all the ways to access our past programs, is always in our emails and is on our website. We now have 210 past programs posted on that YouTube channel. Uh, now, to introduce our speaker, let me first introduce our moderator. Warren Olney was the host and executive producer of the nationally syndicated Public Radio International weekday afternoon program, To the Point. He is the only two-time winner of Los Angeles Society of Professional Journalists Distinguished Journalist Award and the recipient of the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award conferred by his peers, which is especially meaningful, at the radio and television news association of Southern California. And just a bit of legal trivia, not to embarrass Warren, but his grandfather was a justice of the California Supreme Court. So that is very impressive to me. Yeah. Um, anyway, he's a wonderful moderator and a great person. And let me, let me now turn the program over to Warren only. Warren. Hi, Janice. Thank you so much. That's very kind. And I appreciate your introduction. Let me uh, now, uh, I've been very happy to be able to introduce uh, Jacob Halbrun. Again, he's a journalist in Washington, D.C. As you indicated, he is senior editor of and contributor to the National Interest. That is now an online publication. It was started by Irving Kristol, who didn't have online publications. It's published by the Center for the National Interest, which was established by Richard Nixon. Albron is a former member of the LA Times editorial board. He's a former editor, a senior editor for the New Republic. Uh, he is a contributor to New York Times and Washington Monthly. And if, again, his first book was They Were Right. The Rise of the Neocons. His latest, as you indicated before, is called America Last, the Right's Century-Long Romance with Foreign Dictators. Jacob Halbram, welcome to our program. Great to have you. Thank you, Warren. I should note that the first book was They Knew They Were Right, which is a ah, bit thank different. You. you know, I saw that, and I, I, I saw it twice, and I chose the wrong ones. <laughs> That's all right. They knew they were right. Well, and you knew they were right, I presume, as well. Um, I just want to welcome our uh, our viewers as well and remind you that you can ask questions and we will get to them a bit later as the program goes on. So 
On the cover of this new book, I don't have a copy of it myself. Uh, uh, Janice showed it, however. Uh, the title America's Last is superimposed over the words America First. Can you explain that? Well, my beef with the uh, the opponents of Trump is often that they tend to be a little bit timorous and they accept the parameters of debate that he attempts to impose upon them. And so it's off. I don't hear many people pointing out, for example, when Trump advances the slogan, America first, that in fact, he's doing everything that is inimical to promoting American values, American power, and American influence, both at home and abroad. And that's why I thought that America last was, a, was the perfect definition for what he represents. Sounds like a warning. It is a warning because, uh, and that is in part, as I discuss at the very end of the book, my own family background, which is that my father emigrated as a six-year-old to the United States by himself in 1940 mm -hmm. from Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. So I have grown up with, uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, where they're also in a heavily Jewish community in Squirrel Hill. And these, these, what has occurred in the past is not remote to me. And when I hear the language and the accents that are being set today, I don't mean to be an alarmist. I'm not a doomsayer, but there are too many commonalities between the radical path that the Republican Party has embarked upon today and what occurred in Europe in the 1920s and early 1930s. And that is something that I delve into in the book as well. You introduced Donald Trump at the Center for the National Interest when he gave what you describe as his only foreign policy speech uh, in the uh, 2016 primaries. And you saw then that things had changed, you say, but you also saw things that were familiar. What do you mean? What, did, what was old? What was new? Well, Trump was promoting himself as a foreign policy realist who would break with the interventionist traditions of the Republican Party. And I was already wary of him at that point. And I was taken aback. I was sitting off stage, probably 20, 30 feet from him, and was taken aback to hear him repeatedly enunciate the phrase America first, which is, of course, redolent of Nazi sympathizers and isolationists in the late 1930s and 1940s, who fought tooth and nail to prevent Franklin Roosevelt from aiding Great Britain in its struggle against Nazi Germany. So I found that rather off-putting, and I actually wrote an article or an essay for Politico that evening explaining, explaining my impressions of Trump and why I did not take him all to, not that I didn't take him seriously, but that I found him, his, his foreign policy doctrines to be thin and derivative. So that was, that was basically my take on Trump. And I was quite, I was consistently critical of Trump. In fact, the campaign blew a gasket over that piece. That must have made you feel good. <laughs> well, it was fine. I mean, I met Trump at that event too, in a, at a private reception, and I'm I remain I have to say I remain bewildered by how many people are fearful of him or reluctant to incur his wrath. Frankly, I mean this is what I said right in the political piece. He's not a particularly imposing or impressive figure in person. So I I just I'm I remain baffled why so many people are cowering before him. Who's cowering before him that uh, you find that you think ought not to be? Well, it's obvious that much of the Republican Party has fallen into line. I mean, he, is, he said that uh, he was caught on a hot mic saying that he wanted Republicans to stand up the way they do when Kim, the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un enters the room. They are unwilling 
to criticize any of his transgressions, not only unwilling to criticize, but are now have become his Praetorian guard, as we see in the Manhattan trial, where much of the House Republicans troop there to enunciate what they know are falsehoods to defend him. You uh, let's we'll get back to Trump, obviously, as, as we go along. But in the book, uh, you go way beyond uh, the, in the past, beyond the, the 20s and 30s or to uh, the beginning of World War One and, and the uh, the romance, if you will, to use a word from your title uh, with Kaiser Wilhelm. Well, I tried what I tried to argue in the book is that what all the things that we hear today, the hostility to immigrants, the contempt for democracy, the uh, affinity for dictators, not just wanting to work with dictators, but actively admiring them, has its origins in World War I, when a nascent right, which, in, which included pro a prominent journalist named H.L. Mencken, who is, of course, quite famous as a satirist, but who was also violently pro-German, both before, during, and after World War I, and also was an isolationist. And while I wouldn't call him a slavish admirer of Hitler, he, he refused to criticize the Nazis and called for a, what he called an intelligent fascism in the United States. So I thought that many of the trends that we see today are not new, that Donald Trump hasn't really invented anything, but that we see the first wave in World War I in sympathy for Prussian authoritarianism. And that then morphs into, in the 1930s, outright sympathy for Nazism. So I argue that they weren't, many of them weren't simply isolationists, they were actually pro-fascist. You say when you hear uh, terms like wokeness and the deep state and abortion and immigration and media bias, maybe they've been updated a bit, wokeness would be one of those, I suppose. Uh, you say those are not novel ideas. No, I mean, H.L. Mencken and others were promoting, uh, were satirizing elites, the globalists of the day were, were denounced. Uh, in fact, that, that term was even used. Um, by Henry Cabot Lodge and others, who was the leading Republican who sabotaged Woodrow Wilson's attempt to join the League of Nations in 1919. And uh, Mencken scorned globalists. He was essentially a Nietzschean, and I think contempt for mob, what he considered the mob, contempt for open contempt for democracy, called the Confederacy the highest form of aristocracy in the United States, none of that has died away today. We hear it all again. Particularly, it's been embraced by the uh, MAGA faction and by Trump himself, as we saw at Charlottesville, the attempt now to rename Confederate uh, bases in the South. It's, it's quite remarkable. I mean, what it really testifies to is that our notion of progress is false, that it is not inevitable that we move, march forward in a liberal or more progressive direction. We can, in fact, move backwards. There is the determined faction in the United States that has always promoted these ideas, and they've never given up. The conservative movement, as I seek to show in my book, has been extraordinarily tenacious. Going back uh, to the League of Nations, uh, what other uh, other things can you point to that uh, were the results of the uh, of the uh, frame of mind that you're you're defining uh, besides the loss of the League of Nations, the failure of the United States to join it? Well, there was widespread despondency in the United States, of course, after World War One, the Treaty of Versailles was seen as a punitive peace that had punished Germany. And it was, was it really a war for democracy? People felt that they had been hoodwinked by Woodrow Wilson. Liberals too, much as in the wake of the second Iraq war, felt disillusioned by Wilson's promises. So America in the 1920s lurched into nativism, 
the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, anti-immigration measures. In 1924, you have the passage of the Reed Johnson Act, which essentially terminates immigration from Eastern and, and Southern Europe and tries to elevate what they called Nordics. In fact, the LA Times in 1924 had a big headline called seeing the Reed Johnson Act was seen as a victory for Nordic supremacy. And it wasn't overturned until 1965 by Lyndon Johnson. So many of the themes that we see, the, the rise of isolationism too in the 1920s really emerged then and have been picked up by Trump and his coterie today. How now, was... whether that's conscious or not is another question, but it doesn't have to be. All I wanted to show in the book is that there is a circular feel to all of this. How important uh, was anti-Semitism at that point, and how would you compare it to, to where we are today in that regard? Anti-Semitism was very important because you had the rise on the far right, particularly linked with the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution. It was seen as having been financed by the Rothschilds, by Jacob Schiff, by Wall other Wall Street bankers. They were supposedly in cahoots, had lent the money to Lenin to stage this revolution. Jews were viewed in the United States by the right in the 1920s and 1930s as a subversive force. I focus in the book on a New York businessman named Merwin K. Hart, who later became, who was a mentor of William F. Buckley Jr. and became the head of the John Birch chapter after World War II. A virulent anti-Semite, a fan of both Francisco Franco, the Spanish dictator, and of Adolf Hitler, a violent anti-communist, he argued that Jews in the United States, particularly in Manhattan, were plotting to stage revolution and that Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal was permeated with disloyal Jews who were try also trying to bring communism to the United States. That was a prominent theme on the right in the 1930s. It was, of course, called the Jew Deal as well by opponents of Roosevelt. And there was another person that I focus on the former gen general, George Van Horn Mosley, who said that any Jew that had emigrated to the United, that was Im imminently emigrating to the United States should be sterilized. I mean, there were, there were these, this, I also looked at a woman named Elizabeth Dilling, who was prominent on the right, spoke to gatherings of thousands in the United States, was called the female Fuhrer in Germany. She visited the Nuremberg rallies, she was close to the Nazis. A lot of these figures may seem obscure today, and in, some, and in many ways they are, but I wanted to show in the book that at the time they were on the front page of the New York Times, they were making waves. So they can't simply be dismissed as kooks. They were a constituent element of the right in America. The broader theme is that the barrier between what we see as the far right and the mainstream right was often much more permeable than American historians have assumed. And that interpretation of American history is rapidly changing now that Trump came to power and is vying for another term. You mentioned uh, Nuremberg. Uh, somewhere in the book, uh, uh, you point out that uh, somebody said that the Nuremberg trial was worse than Dachau. Uh, it's an extraordinary statement. Uh, elaborate on that, if you will. Where did that come from? Who said it? Well, there were there were numer numerous people on the right had been isolationists, including Senator Robert Taft from Ohio and Joe McCarthy in an episode that is not well known. I, I pointed out that uh, American soldiers had shown a white flag at the bottom of a bulge and I believe at least 100 were massacred. And it's, it's called the Malmedy Massacre. Mm -hmm. So this occurred in 1944 in the winter. And the War Department, as, as it was known then, prosecuted these SS soldiers, including someone who had been uh, close to Hitler in, the, in this SS division named Joachim Pieper. And 
what occurred was that they were they were found guilty these nazis but what occurred was that the defense counsel who had been an american was embarrassed by his loss and he went around claiming that these prosecutions were vindictive a witch hunt so to speak and that these german soldiers were innocent mccarthy had just been elected to the senate and needed an issue so the first issue that he latched onto, he came from Wisconsin and one of his backers, not to get too into the weeds, was a German American who was pro-Nazi, his, his biggest financial backer in Wisconsin. So McCarthy seized upon this issue and said that he called the Nazi soldiers innocent GI Joes in a letter and he berated the Jewish councils who had prosecuted the Nazi soldiers. And he was, he was shouting things like, would you want to be interrogated by a man with a name like Goldberg? And then he called them 39ers in reference to refugees from Nazi Germany. So Joseph McCarthy, in a seminal episode in the Senate, is standing there defending Nazis who had murdered American soldiers. And this view was pervasive. This sympathy for the Third Reich remained pervasive on the right after World War II. I won't go into all the details, but in publications, there were contentions that the United States had perpetrated crimes that were equal to or worse than what the Nazis had done in the concentration camps, including the bombing of Dresden. There was a woman named Frida Utley who wrote a book for Regnery Press, which was a newly established conservative press after World War II making these allegations. There were other books denouncing Israel that appeared on the right. And a lot of this stuff, some of this stuff filtered into the National Review as well, which by the way, denounced um, the trial of Eichmann in Israel. The uh, James Burnham, who was a senior editor at the National Review attacked that is Victor's justice. So there is this constant sub rosa sympathy for the Third Reich on the right. To what extent was there support for uh, in, in countries that were becoming dictatorships, some of which might even have been uh, uh, democratic or started out as being democratic? And, and how does that illustrate uh, the kind of warning that you are uh, giving to us here in the United States? Well, you know, we want to be careful because, you know, again, I don't want to say that we're, we're heading into a Nazi regime. My, but, you know, it's, it's we, at a minimum, what Trump want, aspires to is what Viktor Orban has done in Hungary, which is to quash the free press, hand over leading industries to his cronies and cozy up to Vladimir Putin. I mean, Hungary, Viktor Orban is trying to stymie any assistance from the European Union to Ukraine. A lot of this revolves around Ukraine. The, as we saw over, the, over recent months, the House Republicans have become hostile to Ukraine, which may not be a perfect democracy, but it is a democracy and it has been targeted in a genocidal war by Vladimir Putin. And how is it that our that so many Republicans now, as even leading Republicans are now saying, have become sympathetic to these regimes? So that's why I keep sounding these warning bells. The, the, the trend lines are bad. Uh, you say genocidal? Do you think the the Ukrainian war is genocidal? I think it is nearing that. When when what Putin did in Bucha, when you willfully slaughter civilians and with the the terror that they are attempting, when Putin talks about the the idea that there is no such thing as a legitimate Ukrainian nationality or nation, we are entering perilous territory. If Putin were able to that the territory that he conquers. He imposes terror. This is, and I have no doubt that he would he would ruthlessly purge that society and seek to crush it. 
He wants to eliminate the idea of an independent Ukraine. We are getting close to genocide there. Uh, people say, I, I, this is beside the point as far as your book is concerned, but I can't help but uh, mention it. Uh, people are saying uh, similar things about what's happening in Gaza. And uh, that's, of course, extraordinarily controversial. I'm just interested in your take on it. And uh, to what extent does that contribute uh, to the kind of uh, uh, concerns that you've raised? Um, of course, people are drawing that parallel. And there is a piece by Ari Nair, former head of Human Rights Watch in the New York Review books, arguing that it is genocide. I don't see it that way. Um, because I don't think that there's an attempt to liquidate the population. It's not been voiced as an explicit goal either. So I do believe we need we do need to be careful about using that term. And when I in the Russians, I say close to. I don't think it's occurring right now. But the language and the statements, if the Israeli government were to say we want to liquidate the last vestiges of Palestinian nationality and expel them all from these territories. Now, there are some people in Israel, obviously, that are talking like that, but I don't, I don't see Prime Minister Netanyahu going down that road. That would take Israel into extremely perilous territory. Um, The other thing that's been forgotten here is, of course, that Israel was attacked on October 7th. Sure, it's of course. Not, yeah. Putin is waging a war of unprovoked aggression in Ukraine. Thank you. Um, so um, what are some of the groups involved? You, you, When you go back into history, you've heard a few of them, H.L. Mencken and others. H.L. Mencken is fairly well known, but you mentioned some others who weren't very well known. Uh, what, are the, what are the groups and who are the people now that uh, you see that you, you find parallels with uh, to the people of, of the past. You talk about Alex Jones and Steve Bannon and people of that kind? Bannon, yes, is certainly would, would be called. I mean, there was an interesting article in the Daily Beast calling um, Elizabeth Dilling the, the Steve Bannon of the 1930s, <laughs> trafficking. Then you have Father Coughlin. I mean, you. it's not. And then uh, the closest to H.L. Mencken, though he's not at his intellectual level, would be Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson sounds in many ways like H.L. Mencken. Mencken would draw these specious comparisons. He would engage in whataboutism. He would, he would say, well, what about the concentration camps in South Africa, if you're going to talk about the atrocities? That the Germans are perpetrating in Belgium. There are these constant evasions, moral equivalents. So you can draw a lot of parallels between these figures and the current figures and the figures between the past. What is different nowadays is that we never had a president of the United States who vocally supported authoritarianism. No modern president that I can think of. The closest might be Herbert Hoover, who met with Hitler in 1938 and said it would be a great thing if the Nazis controlled Eastern and Central Europe. This was like a week before the Anschluss or annexation of Austria in March 1938. But I don't think any, you know, Nixon had obviously authoritarian tendencies, but he didn't go public with all this. Trump is the first who has really unleashed the inner id of the conservative movement. Uh that's just extraordinary. What about the, the uh, Heritage Foundation? The Heritage Foundation has toppled into the cesspool of demagoguery. It was right wing before, but it was not anti-democratic. They professed to want to promote democracy abroad. And they were not, you know, they, they did, dal there were dalliances with authoritarian figures, right-wing authoritarian figures, whether it's South Africa or Jonas Savimbi in Angola. But there wasn't this close working relationship that appears to exist now with Budapest. And they, they talk about one person at the Heritage Foundation told me he's going to make, for example, the pilgrimage to Budapest. 
They see it as a shrine to worship at, that Viktor Orban has figured out how to really operationalize hardcore conservatism and to promote family values. A lot of this is about, you know, Orban is also anti-Muslim. He's anti-gay. He, he, uh, he, wants, he, has a, he wants a crackdown on social values, anti-abortion. The whole, he's managed to, to pull this off. And that is the ambition here for conservatives, many conservatives not all in the United States. You talk about it as a general term, uh, the illiberal imagination. Uh, how do you define the illiberal uh, imagination? And is that, is that what's behind this? I think it is. I was riffing off of, there's a famous book by Lionel Trilling called The Liberal Imagination, right. which was a, a defense of classical liberalism. If you, if you look at, what are we looking at? We're looking at anti-enlightenment thinking. We're looking at, there's been a long tradition, of course, of conservative hostility to democracy. The franchise was gradually extended in the West. In 1832 and 1867, the British extend the franchise. The country becomes, when I say extend the franchise, you increase the number of people who are allowed to vote. Those are huge steps. The same thing happens in the United States in the 20th century. What we are witnessing is an illiberal movement, which argues that you need a hierarchical society, that you have an elite, what William F. Buckley called a remnant that runs and controls America. It's a radically different view and we see it on the Supreme Court today, which is not expanding rights, but contracting them. That is the, what I would define as illiberalism. Personally, I believe in classical liberalism, that we extend the rights that people have, as we have done, whether it's a marriage or extending the vote to African Americans. Make no mistake, we are now seeing a systematic attempt to maybe not strip African Americans of the right to vote, but to quash it. What do you think of the terminology used by Donald Trump to make America great again? Well, it sounds wonderful, but it presumes, as President Biden has pointed out, that America is not great right now. I think we are underselling the country. And I actually do not believe that America needs to be in crisis. We are, I believe what we are doing is if we are in, we are inflicting, we're inflicting wounds upon ourselves that are not necessary. And I'm not quite sure. I think, I mean, the way I see it is that we have a determined minority or faction that is seeking to overrun the guardrails of democracy to impose its vision on the rest of us. I actually don't believe that there's majority support for what Trump is trying to implement. In the meantime, uh, what are the wounds that uh, you see and uh, how could we avoid them? Well, the wounds are clear. I mean, if you look at the amount of disinformation, I used to think that it was fine to have Fox News as a contrarian voice. But we have, it has lurched into active propaganda, into uh, something like out of 1984, where it, it is, we're getting close to brainwashing people that they're being told, they're being simply being told untruths about the state of the economy, for example, about the nature of President Zelensky in Ukraine. They're, they're echoing Russian propaganda points, calling him a Nazi, a criminal, or claiming that Ukrainians, that all the money that we're sending to Ukraine is being used to purchase yachts for oligarchs or politicians in Zelensky's coalition. Complete falsehoods. Yet I know people personally who believe these things. They do? What do, what do they say when you uh, suggest otherwise? <laughs> They're, you know, they're locked into their bubble. 
maybe you can nudge a little bit with facts, but uh, we have reached a point where a percentage of the population has uh, sort of anesthetized itself to reality. Let me go to uh, some of the questions that we have that uh, John sure. has uh, sent to me uh, on chat. Uh, here's Philip. He says, uh, does Mr. Halbin feel that the current trends toward, trend toward authoritarianism, excuse me, as evidenced by the Republican Party is so far developed that nothing can be done? If not, what can be done? Absolutely not. Um, you know, my book was one very small part of an effort to sound an alert and to try and educate people that what Trump is espousing is not new, that it has had dangerous consequences in the past, and that we should be aware now. I think that Biden and the Democrats need to be more aggressive in pointing out the authoritarian disposition of Donald Trump. I think Biden did that pretty effectively in his Valley Forge speech. And I think it does need to be ginned up more as a campaign theme. I don't think Trump's election is by any means inevitable. Again, I don't think it's a winning message. I don't think that Americans en masse want to be governed by an authoritarian and overthrow our democracy. On the other hand, if not enough people vote, uh, that could happen, uh, even though they don't want it to happen. It certainly could. And that's why we, we look to the past, 19, January 30th, 1933, is when Hitler is appointed to power. And people, many people, including at the leading newspapers in Germany, thought it would just be a temporary arrangement for a few months that he would burn out. So at the same time, and that's why I would say, don't underestimate Trump, but that's why we need to be vigilant and take it seriously. Uh, here's another question uh, from uh, David. He says, what, would you want say that Netanyahu and Trump are similar in their authoritarian inclinations? There are certainly some disturbing parallels because what really uh, I found most disconcerting, well, let's face it, was Netanyahu's attempt to emulate Orban in eviscerating Israel's constitutional rights and setting him itself up above the law in order to avoid criminal prosecution. That to me, and the, you had massive protests in Israel, again, a sign that the society, a democratic society, is not easy to overthrow if people publicly resist as they did in Israel. But various countries have voted essentially for dictatorships, have they not? It can it can happen. Look, it's it certainly happened in Nazi Germany in, in Weimar Germany. But though Hitler never achieved a minority, he a majority, he was installed in power as part of a conservative cabal. Uh, but it could happen in the United States. Uh, in Italy, Maloney, who has proven to be more pragmatic than many people assumed, but also a far right figure. In contemporary Germany today, the far right alternative for Germany party is in the double digits. We've, we've seen that trend in the continent, in France, in the Netherlands, and in, in Sweden. Now there is a backlash in Great Britain, interestingly. Labor looks headed for a landslide victory in a few weeks. So none of this is inevitable. It depends on what on how strongly we defend our democracy. In the book, you talk about Jean Kirkpatrick and uh, what happened with regard to countries in Central America uh, during the Reagan administration. Uh, that's an interesting passage, I think. And uh, uh, it, it, we're not over that yet, or the people in South America, C Central America aren't over that yet. Definitely. And look, the United States has wreaked a lot of havoc in Central and Latin America. And that's one of the reasons, you know, it's not the only reason, obviously, but you do have these unstable governments there. You have widespread poverty. You have people fleeing climate change. That's why we have these surges at the border, which are then exploited politically by uh, right-wing forces to argue that 
we are experiencing an invasion of the United States, when in fact, interestingly, the data show that immigration added tens of billions to the American economy. There was a good article in the Washington Post. Yeah. The United States is an aging society. We need more, not fewer immigrants. Uh, Eric wants to know, do you think the US could become, or is it on the verge of becoming an anti-Semitic country? No, I think it's, I think it's, we really need to be careful here about tossing the term around too freely for, it, it worries me that we will debase the term and, and rob it of the seriousness that it should possess. You can't just say that if someone's critical of Israel, that they're an anti-Semite. It's not true. In fact, many people in Israel are more critical of Israel than American Jews have been. Um, there's, there is anti-Semitism in the United States, but we should, we should be careful. Now, the, the interesting question is, yes, we have seen some manifestations of it on the fringes of the Democratic Party, but we also see President Trump having dinner with a Holocaust denier and, and, and administering tongue lashings to American Jews for not voting for him. So it's an open question as to how much anti, I wonder about the right as well. I'm not, I'm not trying to exculpate left-wing anti-Semitism. I just, I just wonder if there is going to be an efflorescence more on the right than on the left. Nancy Walker has a question about uh, you, uh, Hungary and says, isn't it easier to make Hungarians uh, follow a dictator as they are the only voters there uh, than it is to make Americans do the same thing because they are of many nationalities? I'm sorry, it's not, uh, do you make, is that clear? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, I would phrase it a little differently. I think, that Hungary is a much smaller country with extremely weak democratic traditions. It was a part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire right. until its collapse in 1918. And then Hungary lurched into far-right regimes in the 20s and 30s, and then actually ended up conniving with the Nazis towards in the later part of World War II, in fact, deporting hundreds of thousands of Jews, particularly from Budapest, to their death in the, in the waning months, fi final year of World War II, which is just a shocking tragedy. Um, and then, of course, the Soviets occupied Hungary, and it really wasn't liberated until 1989. So its democratic roots are pretty tenuous. Trump is, would have to come in with an ax into Washington, D.C., and there will be resistance among the states, the Democratic states, to what he is attempting to perpetrate. So there'll be an interesting, it would be, all bets would be off. I mean, the people who talk about the American experiment heading towards some form of civil war, in that case, might not be entirely wrong. Isn't the Heritage Foundation talking about the possibility of, uh, um, of making the civil service uh, all appointed positions rather than uh, with the than as they are now uh, immune from politics? Yeah, he would love to do that. Yeah, um, he's talked about it. I mean, essentially, what you do then is you go back to the 19th century model where it graphed where everyone who's appointed to a government job owes it to you personally. I mean, we're getting back, it's, it's, it's a recipe for corruption. That's why this was eliminated, I think, after the Civil War, under the Pendleton Act, if I'm remembering correctly. And Trump wants personal loyalty. Yeah. Now, we are talking about a kind of Fuhrer principle here. You know, I mean, the ultimate expression of this would be for the army to swear a loyalty of oath to Trump and not to the Constitution. You give them enough time, that's where this guy is headed. But it's an argument against the deep state. The deep state is a canard. There, my other worry, if Trump targets the FBI, the Justice Department, and the CIA 
and destroys these agencies as competent ones, and you have thousands of employees resigning, we are set up for a terrorist attack in the United States. This is malarkey what he is peddling, that there's some kind of deep state conspiracy. We need to use his phrase, we need a deep state. What we need is a, is a, is a competent and effective civil service that is not loyal to a political party, but that is impartial, just as you have, say, in contemporary Germany. This is, this is not news. You don't want the government, the entire government, working at the behest of one man. Uh, Fred has a question. He says, you've outlined the dangers of the far right. Uh, do you see dangers coming also from the far left? You could, but it's not. There's nowhere near the organizational capacity, nor the charismatic leader. Bernie Sanders is a social democrat by European standards. He's not a far left figure. The equivalent of a Trump on the left would be calling, would be, is, I guess, someone like Robert Kennedy or further. Someone who's actually calling for, in essence, a revolution against the government in Washington, D.C. And for he would be calling for nationalization of all industries under, under his aegis. Um, that you would have, uh, you would indoctrinate uh, American students in, in Marxist-Leninism. Uh, that you would, you would determine what grants the government gives on that basis. Look, I hold no brief for either far left or right ideology. In fact, in my book, I explicitly stated the outset that the far left has also worshiped yeah. numerous foreign regimes, whether it's Stalin's Russia or Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam and held them up as a superior model to America. What astonishes me is that the right was susceptible to the same phenomenon. Now here's Carol. She says, do you have any ideas about how we can effectively fight the MAGA right? Well, I mean, this is taking me sort of into, into uh, beyond the, the remit of my book, and which is essentially a narrative history and a warning. Um, I think the most important thing to do is to organize. When, I mean, if you're talking about practical steps, Wisconsin is obviously the model for the Democratic Party. They have done heroic jobs in registering people to vote and in getting the word out. Look, it's it as you alluded to earlier, Warren, if people don't vote, then you can lose your democracy. Uh, here's David. He says, Trump's fascination with foreign autocrats and dictators seems to be related more to their ability to become president for life and not for any particular ideological affinity. If uh, Trump is reelected in November, is there any chance that he would have the ability to rescind the 22nd Amendment? You know, who knows if he would even would have to rescind it or they would, you know, you can create all kinds of scenarios. He just doesn't care. Like, I don't think he's going to actually leave NATO. I think he's just going to say Article 5, which pledges us to a common defense. He, all he has to do is say, I don't care about that. As far as running for a third term, yes, he could go to the Supreme Court or, Cong you know, if he has a Republican Congress, it's, I don't exactly, you know, if he takes, if he tried to take, a, let's say there was, I mean, we're, we're going into wild speculation here, but the New Republic recently did a cover story about this, but I don't think they brought up this scenario, but I, I could see, let's say there was a terrorist attack in the United States and Trump was a fault that, well, then he would ask for emergency powers, right? That's what Hitler did with the Reichstag fire, the Enabling Act in March 1933. After that, that's the end. You know, he has absolute power. So we, you need to eviscerate the democratic institutions. The Supreme Court, I'm inferring from Justice Sotomayor's remarks the other day, where she said she goes into her office and weeps about the decisions that have been in the past and that are upcoming, may well grant Trump some kind of immunity for his actions as president. So, you know, you can hollow out a democracy. That's, that's the fundamental point. You can't take these norms for granted as we have. Frankly, I, look, I'm as guilty as anybody. I never thought that, we would, that America 
would reach this pass and and grope and grasp for an authoritarian leader. Uh, David says, as egregious as the rights values were in the 20s and 30s, how do we succeed in reestablishing the, quote, normalcy, close quote, of the 50s? And will MAGA end up uh, as a passing phenomenon, or is it uh, is the hope to return to normalcy a, a wild dream? No, it's not. Um, FDR obviously was a far more charismatic figure. He and his lieutenants relish the battle against the right. Remember, Roosevelt announces at one at the Democratic Convention, I think in 3060s, he says about the plutocrats, I welcome their hatred. You know, essentially he's saying, bring it on. I'm, I'm coming for you. There, there's no, there isn't this hesitancy. I mean, there, it was a fighting credo, and there's a self-confidence there. I, if Trump loses this election, you know, it's, it'd be a long road, but there are voices of sanity in the Republican Party. I'm not trying to dismiss the, the entire Republican Party. There are sane Republicans in the Senate and the House. What has happened is that Trump has changed the incentive structure. The incentive structure, if you want to get ahead in the Republican Party, is to curry favor with Trump. And that's what most of them are doing. If he is defeated again, I think the party either goes under or has a wake-up call. However, the, the other scenario could occur. They could win everything. They could win the House, Senate, and presidency, and this country will be radically different. Uh, Brad wants to know, how do you see the role of the current Supreme Court in this campaign against democracy? Not good. The court is going further than I thought it would, particularly this nonsensical claim for immunity that Trump has advanced should never have been taken up by the court. Judge Chutkan here in, Was in Washington, D.C., demolished the reasoning, Trump's reasoning, pointing out the United States rebelled against a monarch. We're not, the president is not a monarch. Susan says, an article in today's LA, I assume, it's, I don't know which times it is, spoke of the Wall Street, uh, spoke of Wall Street aligning for Trump, including uh, Jamie Dimon, Schwartzman, and some Jewish leaders of finance. How can this be explained since the Dow was twice as high as when Trump was president? Frankly, I think it's delusional, but what they're focused on is tax cuts. The Trump tax cuts will expire in 2025. And that is what Trump, you know, he's making an explicit quid pro quo. He's saying, you elect me, you'll get your tax cuts. Those tax cuts are stacked towards the wealthy. In this regard, Donald Trump has behaved like a traditional Republican. He's looked out for the fat cats and for big business. That these, these, it's also ruinous for the American economy, frankly, given the deficit we're running. But short-term greed seems to prevail over long-term interest. Yeah, it is unbelievable. Biden has actually done an excellent job with the American economy. He has brought down inflation. Uh, unemployment is at record lows. And he's not getting credit for it. Uh, E.A. Smith in Santa Paula says, uh, can you explain the essential support money ideology and neo-fascist infrastructure that uh, the GOP right-wing Christian nationalist organizations bring to Trump, especially the many think tanks and companies that created Plan 2025 to guide the orange menace in his next administration? Well, let's remember that all of this Project 2025 is a project being run by the Heritage Foundation. And it, it contains, it has, it has a two-pronged element. It has recommendations for what Trump should do if he becomes president. And they are trying to vet thousands of names to be able to staff his administration from day one mm -hmm. to install ideological purists who will pursue an America first agenda which of course means curbing women's rights, t targeting, including con uh, targeting contraception, which is, which is gonna be their next goal. 
uh, people at the Heritage Foundation are openly uh, denouncing contraception. They're calling for a return to the gold standard in the economy. I mean, there is, they're calling for purging the State Department of what they view as communist influences. I mean, this, this the head of the found, Heritage Foundation, Kevin Roberts, in an interview with the New York Times Magazine, praised Joe McCarthy. He said, may have approached it the wrong way, but the impulse was correct. Again, these people are much more radical. Trump, you know, maybe not the most focused guy, but the people that he's going to enable are going to hit the ground running in a, in a second Trump term. It's going to be a very different country. I think it's going to be disastrous. I mean, that's what I was trying to, I have this New York Times op-ed that came out a week ago. And I'm very pessimistic about what would occur to the economy and to America's influence abroad. I mean, I think we're heading into Great Depression territory. If you put in the kind of tariffs that Trump is talking about, and you, you let Putin take over Ukraine, the Chinese are going to be going after Taiwan. It's going to be international chaos. The stock market would plunge. None of this promotes stability that you need for a functioning international economy. Again, this is a warning, not a prediction. I take it. It's a look. I don't actually think my my belief I is that Biden is going to win this election as an incumbent, and I think uh, that Trump is likely to become increasingly radical in his statements in coming months, particularly if he is, as I suspect he will be found guilty in this Manhattan trial. But we're going to find out how big the appetite in America is for what Trump is espousing. Uh, John Ziegler, this may be the last question. Do you think Trump is advocating fascism, reminiscent of developments in Europe 90 or 100 years ago as a result of his study and admiration of that history, or simply that his own ideas are reminiscent of that past history? It's an interesting question. You can't prove it. I mean, you know, his father went, apparently went to a Ku Klux Klan rally. There's the, there's the German heritage. There's the Trump reading, having Mein Kampf at his bedside. I don't think he needs any of this. I think he sort of instinctively gravitates to it. In the book, I talk about this populist mayor in Vienna at the turn of the century who served as the model for Hitler and who fused working class populism with con social conservatism and anti-immigrant fervor to create a winning ticket in Austria. And that really kind of serves as the foot the footbed for the rise of of ideologies like Nazism. Calling Trump a fascist, you know, he doesn't have a he's not that on the other hand he doesn't have to be that sophisticated. We are heading in the direction of of the way he speaks, calling his political opponents vermin, uh, talking about poisoning the blood of America, that is fascist rhetoric. David Lehrer, who uh, used to be, who, who's now deceased and used to be a, a very important uh, producer of this program, always would say to us uh, who were doing the interviews, give him a little opportunity at the end to say something positive. Well, my positive message is, is that this is, I, I, I'm hard pressed to believe that Trump will be able to close the sale, that this is a winning message for America, particularly given at a time of relative prosperity in the United States. And if you look at this professor at AU, Alan Lishman, he has these 11 keys and the keys still favor Joe Biden. Also, I think Joe Biden is wildly underestimated as a president and as a politician. If you look at his State of the Union address, the last one, he, he, he's not somnolent. He's an extremely agile debater and enjoys provoking the Republicans. I predict in the first debate, he's going to trigger Donald Trump and enjoy watching him spin out of control. Jacob Halbrun, uh, author of the uh, America Last, the Wright's century-long romance with foreign dictators. I think you can see from this interview that he is, that's a book that's worth reading. Uh, it was great to have you with us. Thank you so very much, and uh, uh, good luck with the book. Thanks, Warren.
Okay, next week it's going to be Erwin Chemerinsky, the Dean of the Law School at UC Berkeley. Uh, have a good night and uh, a good week as well.